going to be here today. She has another engagement. Um, let's go ahead and start. I think first on our special call agenda is federal funding changes. Dr. Park? So we have been put in a unique situation where um, because we are a new district, relatively new, <coughs> we've uh, been notified this year that we had an increase in our Title I allocation. And what this means is that uh, we are now applying to see if all of our schools can be school-wide schools with a waiver. And we'll get into some of those details in just a minute. Um, but what we want to bring to you today are some positions that we think are necessary to get started with um, having school-wide programs in each of our schools. These positions will be critical to the success of these programs, the development of them, and as we move forward, the, the compliance piece of Title I dollars. So I want to go through with you, before we get into the details of the positions, just a little bit about the Title I basics. <clears throat> as a district, we've had Title I dollars in the past. We've had about 200000 as our Title I allocation. We've operated target assistance programs. And so there are two types of programs you can operate with federal programs, Title I money. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, the first one is targeted assistance. The second one is school-wide. <clears throat> I don't know where my voice is going. Um, so targeted assistance means that you can only use that money to serve that small cohort of students. So these are identified students who are at risk of failing. So it's all focused on a well-rounded education, academically strengthen these to help these students. And then your money is allocated based on free and reduced lunch percentage. So as a district, we have a very small free and reduced lunch percentage. So um, I want to go through with you some of the differences, just some of the things we look at. Overall, as a district, we could be eligible for all of these federal program grants, but the ones that have an asterisk by them are the ones that we receive, oh, sorry, yeah, asterisk by them are the ones we receive for Germantown Municipal Schools. So we receive Title I dollars currently. We also receive Title II, Improving Teacher Quality, which is what we use for professional development. And then we receive Title III funds, which will go for ELL, or English, English Language Learners. English Language Learners, students whose primary language is not English. So if you'll look at the other ones, some of them are competitive <coughs> grants, some of them we are not eligible for, or we don't serve those types of um, Population. populations. So just wanted to give you an idea. When you see Title I, there are a huge list of a lot of titles for federal programs, so <laughs> focus on Title I today. Um, so it's designed to support state and local school reform efforts to meet the challenging academic standards to reinforce and amplify efforts in teaching and learning. Um, so this is the budget process. So if we look at it, um, every year Congress alloc allocates funds or appropriates funds through the legislative process, and those funds go through the U.S. Department of Ed which allocates the funds to the states based on the Title I formula. So then it goes to the states. So let me explain what situation we're in, because this is where it affects us. When we branched off from our parent district, we were originally, for the first three years, considered our standalone district. But the U.S. Census data is what's used to go into that formula that the U.S. Department of Ed allocates funds to the state. It's not the 10-year census, that's the complete census, but every year they update using different metrics. And that's where the funding formula pulls in what the metrics are for each state. So for us as Tennessee, this is our fourth year. So after three years of us looking like we're a standalone district, the U.S. Census data has now recognized that we, we've split. So with that, it says when we split, it duplicated the poverty data from Shelby County. So the state of Tennessee received more Title I dollars because each municipal district duplicated the poverty data from Shelby County. And so the allocation that came to Tennessee was more because it looked like you had a lot of Shelby counties. So from so there, Part of that pickle is the timing of this too. So this is not the typical process where we would be bringing the board. You know we've already approved title funds, but right. that's why we had the emergency call that we were both on. Uh, with the state telling us that this is going to be something that's going to change, we're going to have to do an amendment. But because we're dealing with the hiring season, that's why we need to have this meeting. Because sure. we need to go ahead and get some people on board and let this process play out. And then when we get the funding, we'll come back and, and do that. So she'll address. So, and I'm going to go through and show you some of the extensive processes that we're going <coughs> to have to go through, which is why we need to go ahead and have some people in place. 
They're going to so have to do the process. They, they have to help us yeah. with the process. So once the states get the funds, they also have a formula um, that they distribute to the districts. That's where we found our new allocation or our final allocation for this upcoming year is the $2.2 million. And then um, as a district, we have certain amount of um, required set-asides. So we have to set aside funds for equitable services for non-public school students. So that means any of our students that are zoned to any of our schools that attend a private school in our area, if they are at a Title I school, then the money has to follow the child. So we have to set aside, based on the numbers that the private schools have turned into us, a certain portion to go along with those students. And those students have been identified, they've already been submitted to us, that's just part of the normal process anyway. We go through and vet to make sure that they are zoned to one of our schools and then that's the portion of money that the private schools can use of Title I dollars to operate a Title I program. And those are only students that are residents of Sherman Town? Yes. Okay. okay. And so um, from there we also, like we have district set-asides, but then from that district set-aside, which you'll see <coughs> can be consolidated at a <coughs> position to oversee all of the, the grant programs or Title I, then we can have a professional development initiative which you'll see is Title I coaches. So they will go in and work with the teachers to help provide the on-site professional development co-teaching methods, those kind of things. Then we're also required to have family involvement. So a big portion of the Title I initiative is to obviously help those students who are, are from a low-income family have more support from the community. Mm -hmm. So by law, we are required to have a percentage of our funds set aside. We haven't had that in the past because it's if you receive more than $500,000. So we haven't received that much, but now we are receiving a little bit more than $500,000. <laughs> so we have to have, we have to go along with that formula for the required set asides. And then from there, the money that's remaining, um, we allocate to the school. So every school will have their own Title I budget. And with that, the money is allocated based on the population and then the number of students to per pupil allocation. And one of the things that you'll see is as the schools start doing their school improvement plans that are tied to the district improvement plans, they may come back to us and say, we want to add counseling positions, we want right. to add these key positions. And those are things that will then come back to the board in this process and say, these are what, these this, are what right. the schools are asking for to support their program. So, you'll, so the guess is that our request for positions is just the initial request sure. to get this started and then when the school is going to come back with more. So this one, is, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. one of the things that you mentioned was about the fact that we duplicated the poverty, le poverty levels. Um, is that, will that, when will they re-look at that? When will Four years. Okay, so. And so that's the only new thing on this slide. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yet. But it's just once we're recognized by the U.S. Census that it's a transition period of four years. Okay. So I don't know how much our funds will be cut from this from initial that. year to the next year. Um, but I do know based on Title I funding requirements, we are required to spend 85% of our funds and can only carry over 15% from funding year to funding year. So if we spend 85% of our $2.2 million, then we can carry over 15% to the next year. But one of our challenges that we are addressing is the fact that there could be a serious reduction in this in year two. So they said we're transitioning over the four years, but they could come back and say 70% is cut uh, for next year. And we won't know that till we start the budget process for next year. So we're being very transparent on the front end with human resources to say to these individuals saying, just so you know, this could be a one and done situation. So um, right. that poses a problem too for us hiring. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, well, and not only that, I mean, if we go two years, three years in, the school becomes used to certain <clears throat> programs. Yes. And then we have to look at in four years, say it does last the four That's years, correct. then do we, we have to reevaluate what, how do we sustain that with the budget that we have <coughs> now been reduced by. 1.5 million dollars. That will be a decision point right. for the board. Okay, but that could come sooner it is, it rather is, than you know, later. It's, it's, it's a great yes. opportunity to look at it. It could come next year. It could come next year. It could come in two years. Okay. It's not a bad position to be in. No, no it's but a it's challenging, challenging to your point. The, it's a little bit more. The point is to be transparent right. on the front end so that right. we're not uh, hurting people's or fam families sure. with sure. transitions. Or even the schools. Right. Absolutely. So there are some fiscal rules that we have to consider with Title I dollars. A district budget is a little bit or is a lot more flexible than Title I dollars or federal dollars in general. 
So the main issues we've got to look at is maintenance of effort. We've got to spend at least 90% of the same um, amount that we spent previously. That's just district budget overall. We've got to show maintenance of effort. Comparability means that we've got to have equitable services. Um, state local funding at Title I schools is equivalent to the funding in non-Title I schools. This is something we've completed every year since we've been a district is our comparability report because we have had Title I. We've never had any issues. We've always met comparability. Um, and as we, if we continue to use this third bullet, supplement, not supplant. So this is Title I dollars. If you look at it in a budget sense, it's like the cake is what the district funds are. The icing is Title I funds. So it's anything additional, it's that extra. It's something that you don't have to have, but it's just super nice and, you know, it's, it might be the best part that you can get. Um, so then the last thing is all purchases must be reasonable and necessary. That's one of the guidelines for federal dollars. And it has to align with the identified priority needs that the schools will come up with. So um, <coughs> this is all tied to our e-plan that you hear us discussing. And we have a district improvement plan, then every school has a school improvement plan. This is not anything new, not an additional requirement. But what we do have to be very careful of with our school improvement plans and our district improvement plan is that every school's purchases out of their own budget, like when they put <coughs> their budget of Title I money, has to be aligned to their goals and their identified priority needs. So everything that they purchase has got to align back to those, those areas. So the initial piece of it is the comprehensive needs assessment. This is where you just um, go through and look at the data, look at trends that are happening within the school. Um, and then it helps to look at the impact of any programs and look at student achievement. It helps us refine practices within the school. So these are the five areas and then I'll stop and we can talk about <coughs> positions. So all of the purchases need to be aligned to anything that falls in these five areas. These are the areas that we look at for school improvement and for district improvement. So student achievement is one of these, curriculum and instruction is another, professional development, family and community involvement, and school context and organization. So student achievement, that's where we go in and we can look at the subgroups or super subgroups as you may hear on our accountability model. We look at the data that's coming back from the state to say, okay, which subgroups performed poorly? How can we address those students? What are some extra materials that we may need to do to provide differentiation in the classroom? Um, and that ties into curriculum and instruction as well. Professional development, do we see the need um, for, for our teachers? Like as a district, we may not see it as a huge need, but as an individual school, they may have pockets that have higher need than we see at the district level. So this is where um, the principals and the school improvement planning team can look at and see if there are trends or anything that they need for assistance in the professional development area. Family and community involvement, again, this is one of the requirements of um, Title I dollars. So there will be a pot of money set aside at each school for the family and community involvement. And it's to look at activities. I think we do a great job as a district with family and community involvement. I think our schools do a lot of that but how are we focusing those events? How are we really targeting the areas to highlight what we need for parents to truly understand what's going on in the classroom? And then the last one is school context and organization. So what are we doing as a school to make it, um, you know, we could look at the library, we could look at media centers, we can't um, pay for facilities, but we can look for additional um, resources to provide in the schools outside of what we already provide. So when you plan a school-wide program, you've got to go through this whole process, and it's a lot. So that's where we're going to look at um, where we are right now with our request and the steps for additional funding. So on the handout that you have, um, something to note is if you are 40% or higher, according to Title I rules, then you're eligible for a school-wide program, 40% of free and reduced lunch. We don't have any schools at that level. Um, anything below that could be targeted assistance, which is why we've operated with targeted assistance in Riverdale and Houston High School. So at this point, the state has said when they called us to tell us that we had this additional funds, I said there's no way we can spend that in two schools with targeted assistance because it's only supposed to be for that small cohort of students. It can't be a school-wide initiative. And they said for us to um, submit waiver requests. It was their recommendation. It was their recommendation, and it is allowable under ESSA. So 
we have submitted those requests to the um, state. They notified me yesterday that they're going to review those requests this week and give us feedback on whether or not and, and let us know if we need to tweak anything. But I think if it was their recommendation, I feel pretty strongly that they're going to right. go with that. Yeah. Um, so then the next step is the request for approval for initial positions needed to operate effective Title I programs. These are based on district needs. So this is not something where I just made these positions up and said, hey, this yeah. sounds great. These are standard positions these in are, a lot of title schools. And these are positions that I think specifically for German County Municipal School will help us. Sure. Um, they'll help us. You've asked me previously what my vision was for our department. This will help us um, right. transition there. We do have new standards coming up for science and social studies. <coughs> this will help us have somebody focused in that area. So um, we'll get into those in, in just a little bit. So the next one is to move forward and hire the approved positions and begin training on the requirements and compliance for federal dollars. Then those teams will go out and host school meetings with school-wide planning teams. So a school-wide planning team technically should have parents, students, teachers, and administration on the school-wide planning team. And so we need to have those meetings to help look at the comprehensive needs assessments, identify priority needs, and set the academic goals. Then we'll need to develop school level budgets for allocations, submit all of this through ePlan to the Tennessee Department of Ed. Once that we get approval for that, then it will come back to us to do a full budget amendment okay. so we can go through all of everything that's been developed. And, and what is the, just the overall timeline? Like, what, I mean, so it's a lot. lot. Typically, <laughs> yes, typically in this process, this would have, like I said, this would have happened during the normal budget season when we're getting our allocation right. from Ms. Gersky of the state that we would, we would already see this money coming down. During our budget process, we would have talked about, we would approve these positions, and then the normal hiring process would have happened. So my guess is in the next uh, month and a half, two months, we should complete this uh, okay. process. Okay. So okay. that's why the request is for us to approve these positions or ask the board to approve sure. these positions. Um, then we've got a plan that we can pay for it out of general fund right now um, where it doesn't have an impact because it hadn't been approved by the, the state yet. Then uh, once the other approvals come, we'll come back to the board and say, okay, now we have the final money. Here are the plans. Um, and we'll get everything shifted back where it's supposed to be. Typically, if you're bringing on any new schools as Title I school, you would identify them the 1st of March, and then you would have March to July to plan and train <laughs> and get everybody on board and get your committee, planning. and then you're ready to go July 1. Um, we don't have that luxury, so we're trying to be as effective quickly. as quickly as, you know, and, okay. and make it as comprehensive, because I don't want us to do anything that's not in compliance, but I'm, you know, make sure we follow the rules but we also have to get school started and all the others. Right. So looking at the positions requested, we currently have Dr. Fuller who has um, taken over the role of federal program specialist. He has just been a ten and a half month employee and so we are looking to move him to a 12 month um, employee or possibly 11 months. We're going to talk with him further. Mr. Haddo, did you? Left a message. Okay. Yeah, I spoke to him once this morning then left a message. So at the high range over here to the side, this is not, this is a current position we have, so we would just change the salary matrix that this person okay. would be on. Okay. And this is not a new position, but he will be coordinating all the efforts for Title I, Titles 1, 2, and 3. Okay. So our ELL program is something that we have not had it as a huge priority, but it is part of our accountability model. Mm -hmm. And we want to make sure that we have somebody that can really focus attention on that and the instruction for those students. And previously with his position, this was just a part-time because he was only managing and spending $200,000. He was right. doing a lot of different things along with this. Right. But because this is such a large amount of money and the paperwork and the requirements that we'll have for this, it will become a full-time. Uh, position. Will right he now. continue with the other things he's doing or will we um, farm those out maybe to others? One, maybe one, like 5%. So if we're talking about okay. an allocation of 100%, okay. 95% will be doing federal programs. And we have to document the time on that right. too. Okay. And then 5% he'll still help with fine arts. Okay. Um, so the same amount Just of time. Just have the he's district support to okay. kind of be the coordinator of the fine arts. Center. And the homebound will mm -hmm. move Homebound has gone to the high school. So an interventionist okay. that's paid out of district at the high school will be handled like homebound. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm just trying yes. to so we're taking that mentally off of his, taking that off, off of his, his plate, plate so he can focus more. That makes sense. Great. Okay, so the next position is one that um, is a new position and it's necessary. Title I coordinator 
This is somebody who would work with the principals and the school level teams to develop the school improvement plans and my idea would be to have somebody who has experience in this area who understands from the principal standpoint the teacher standpoint the budget standpoint all of it because this is going to be completely brand new to our principals they don't have somebody there who's been through this you know process so they know they're going to need a lot of support so this person will work alongside with dr fuller but this person dr fuller will probably you know we'll, we'll always need somebody to manage our federal programs but this position is necessary to manage and help get our compliance together for Title I, this large amount of money, and work really with the schools at the school level. So I, I don't think we'd need them as 12 months at this point, so that's why they would be an 11 month position. Okay. And when we're looking long term, this position will probably be phased out because as we go back to a smaller budget, we, you won't need that position. You'll still so need it. like a contract. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so the next one, this is where I get to kind of live out my vision. <laughs> <laughs> um, Title I instructional coaches, this would be five positions. They would be um, in, based out of my department. This would be a district initiative if you look at district set aside allowability for Title I dollars. So these positions, I would um, like to have those to help be an extension of our current department, but to have them in five different areas. So my, math, science, social studies, language arts and then STEM to help us with 21st century learning and move forward with those efforts that we have um, and to try to strengthen those. So those would be the initial five positions and these are just from the district level. Now if schools want to add positions at their level then that's something that they have the option to do out of their own budget based on what the needs based they have. Yeah, based on their programs and how extensive and mm -hmm. okay. But then again we have to make sure that they understand going forward that yeah. people understand they might that's, not. That might not happen. This is excellent. Um, so the next one, Title I Implementation Coach. So we've got this as admin support at the school. So this would be somebody based at each school. So at each school, this person would be responsible for what I used to call the black box, but it's the box that keeps up with all of the documentation required. So that would take it off of the APs or the principal and not put it on the counselors and not have it on the teacher. But this person would also help to plan and implement any of those family involvement nights, parent oh, nights, yes. um, and those activities. So I think that would be a um, good position to have. These are not necessary to start with right now, um, but this is something we would like to hire as much, uh, you know, as quickly as we can. We're looking at the salary range, either teacher scale, because we we know that this is a position that may it's going to phase out as we don't need it when we don't have as much money um, moving forward. But it's also something where I put in there, it could be retiree pay at 60% because this may be something that a retiree wants to have. Um, mm -hmm. may want to come in and sure. work their maximum amount of days, which is 120 days. So that's just an option that I left in here for you all to approve and look at and see if it's something you'd be interested in because- That's a great idea. idea. Great that's use. Mr. Manuel's idea. <laughs> idea. Um, so. Question on that, it, would that, I know the instructional coaches would be coming from your office, so they would be answering to you. The implementation coach who's located at the school, who who do they ultimately answer to? Do they answer to you or do they answer to the principal? They would Outside. actually be under the direction of the Title I coordinator. Okay, so Dr. Fuller. No, no the, the Title I coordinator. Oh, the coordinator, the I'm guy. sorry, the new guy, mm -hmm. the person. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and they would, they would be on site under right. the direction of the principal, but under the guidance of the Title I coordinator. Okay. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. I just want to do that. I mean, that's yes. yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, just I, making sure, you know, I'm thinking family um, activities. I'm just trying to make sure I, I understand how that, yeah, who he's school answering. Based, school, school based, based but, yeah. But, but direction, but direction from comes the from one God, coordinator. That helps. Just to make sure whatever activities they want to plan, it meets all of their requirements, all the parent right to right. know notifications that are required to go out for federal programs. Like, they would have that guidance from this Title this I person. coordinator. But what they plan at the school level in terms of family nights, um, of course, if it's curriculum nights, we'll, we'll have a say sure. in that. But anything else, they can be worked out with the principal. Excellent. Well, and they're right there for the teachers as well in right. the new programs, yeah. Right. So um, then the Title I financial secretary, obviously, if we have this much money, we need <laughs> yes. somebody to be able to. Um, process all of those purchase requisitions and purchase orders because it will 
be a lot and um, we can't follow our district policy of the no we don't need three quotes on items because it's federal money and you're required to have that to show right. it is okay. reasonable okay so um, we're gonna that's gonna be a lot of um, work work and documentation and we've been in the low risk category previously with federal program dollars because we've received so little sure and this puts us in a high risk category and so I want to make sure we have all of our bases mm -hmm. covered to show that we are spending everything appropriately and then the last one is federal program senior accountant so this person would work under Kevin Jones and serve as um, like an internal monitor for all of our federal programs they would not come directly out of our grant so when we write our grant up um, for our budget you won't see this position there this will be paid for out of our indirect costs where we're allowed to take money to cover for anything that the district has to do okay. specifically for that so that will be listed in, in a budget amendment but in a different area so this position, um, the federal program senior accountant, is very helpful in the separation of duties that's required um, as internal controls for our federal programs. Quick question: Do most uh, you said these were usually ones that most schools had with positions they have with the amount of funding? Mm -hmm. Is that true with this federal program senior accountant? I mean, yes, or, yes. So um, where I previously worked, we had. I had bookkeepers, which were our Title I secretaries or financial secretaries, and then as part of the CFO position, Department. we did have a second person who went in and monitored and helped with us when we had to request funds every month. So we take kind of it on Mr. Jones. Mm -hmm. Or Ms. Kinley. So some other way that Ms. Mona manages yeah. all the school financial accountants. Otherwise, you have someone just managing, managing all the federal accounts. So this would put, if we didn't do this, this would put that bit on them. Yes. Okay with it being such a large amount of money. Well, mm -hmm. having the ability to get someone who has that expertise as well would be nice too. Absolutely. So there are some positions that we really want to look at or that we need to look at hiring immediately and or um, changing or adjusting immediately. So those would be the ones with the asterisk over on the side. But it would be the federal programs coordinator. That would be what Dr. Fuller um, would be moving to in that title. Title I coordinator and the Title I instructional coaches. Um, with those positions, if we do have teacher, you know, I want it to be our really strong teachers in these mm -hmm. fields. So I want to do that before school starts so that schools have a chance to replace those teaching positions with somebody that's so just quick quick quality. Quality. So if we move these strong teachers over to these positions and then the positions go away. And that's one of the things that we've talked I mean, about I'm transition. Just, I mean, yeah. we're, then we're, we are, we're, good good team. we're actually in a good position um, right. when we're talking about whatever we're doing with the new school. Um, we we're, we're talking about expanding our, our schools. Positions will open up in the district. And we have been averaging, uh, yes. when we look at retirees, mm -hmm. there are open positions. It's just gonna be something that they will have a priority for placement over. Okay. Um, That's why I wanna make sure that, that there was, that we did have something in yeah. place that we possibly wouldn't lose these good teachers yeah. if they went out to these positions. Because otherwise, some of the good teachers aren't gonna wanna Right. Do this yes. if they could, they could lose their job after Something I'm not doing right now is filling a position that I have vacant in my department because if we do have to absorb something for next year, I want to be able to. And the same thing, thing financial. So, sector. Missy Abel, who took the right. vice principal position, that's the one that we're not backfilling right now in order to. But just to get all this running yes. fine tuned and then that's determine right. what you need, right? right. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Perfect sense. Mm -hmm. So would these other positions that are not asterisks be ones that we would go after after we got the funding approved yes. and that we have it in and then the we would process. move forward? Okay. But to get us started and sure. get the plans yeah. done and get everything budgeted, we're trying to get a skeleton crew. Maybe to we may bring this to you in August. I, I know, I, mean, I love it. No, yeah, we, yeah, I mean, when no, you get the approval, yeah. We're going to today, but we may not hire them until sure. August. Sure, yeah. Right. yeah. 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 Today, do, we, you want, do you want to approve hiring all of these today? I would like to approve these having these po or approve these positions today, but knowing that I would only feel the ones for the asterisk. Mm -hmm. So they're 14? Yeah. And 14. so then what you'll 13. see in August or September, hopefully August, is um, the Dark process goes quick line. enough. A budget amendment uh, essentially saying we want to go ahead and fund these positions that we previously discussed. Here's a budget amendment. Here's where we're recognizing mm -hmm. the income coming from you know, the federal title funds. And so now we'd like to approve these positions in the budget process. So you'll essentially that really approve them right. uh, financially at that time. 
So today we want to approve all the positions. Then. Yeah. Okay. Um, what position does this put um, our principals in when we remove <coughs> excellent teachers from the classroom? And then, I mean, there's we're there's less, we're just a, a couple of week we're just a couple of weeks away from school. A lot of teachers have already made commitments. Yes. Signed contracts to other districts potentially. Um, it's going to be a building burden. Okay. And we might have people paying for it. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, but, but I mean, no, but, I mean you, yeah. there, if you're looking for a certain skill set, yeah. then they might not necessarily be um, within our district potentially. Yeah. So, so are you casting just within the district or outside yeah. as well? Yeah. Every right. wide net. Wide net. So we just can cost paint somewhere else. Yes. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, but yes. Not really. Municipalities have an agreement not to touch someone 30 days out. And then there's a, also an agreement with Shelby County Schools. You really don't want to get into an ethical taking teachers as close to school year starting. Right. Um, but we try to work with each other. But the other side of it is is that there's probably some people in this district that may look at some of these positions and jump to another system as well. Because that salary and they're trying to get their foot in the door in a in a Next administrative level. capacity. Right. So it's really just the other uh, what, I, what, I, what, what, I, what I'm concerned about is that there's right. gotta they be have some, to do it too. Right. You may be starting this school year with some really high profile teachers that are unfilled because they may be hard to fill with, with the time and circumstances. So what year. do we do with that? What's you have that Kelly Services that certified staff okay. members that, that jump in. Um, and but it is, yeah, what do you do with that is if you say a lot of prayers. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, because it, even, even with a typical year, you're going to have some late resignations or retirees that right. just don't have the, and, and here you go. Um, and yeah, so, so one, one strategy is this is, is to look at the retirees, look at the outsiders who are coming in, look yeah. at Apple Tracks, mm -hmm. and really research who these, you gotta get the job posted and then research who the pool applicants are. And then you, you move forward. Okay. But yes, the second that I heard that we were receiving this funding, my first thought was the hiring process. Sure. Oh no, here we go. Yeah, because that's... And time and circumstance is a problem. If all the municipalities so all the municipalities have the situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They all got the Bartlett, Carrieville, Millington. Millington didn't get that much more. They didn't yeah, get that much more because they already had Lakeland. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Wow, we may see a lot of shuffling. Get on it. That's right. I like to yeah, do that. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but get the get the worm. Yeah. Go yeah. ahead. Any other questions for Dr. Um, Mark, Ms. Landers? I noticed. Um, in improving the 13 positions, do you need to also approve the modification? Yes, it yes. yes. That, okay, that was my thing. I was looking at the pre-done motion and, okay. Um, one question on the maintenance of efforts, oh, yes. the 90%. Is that and the only if our mm -hmm. numbers the federal stay the same from the federal, the federal government? Job, um, right, I mean, well, if, if, for program. example, if they reduce, they come in and they reduce, do we still have the federal maintenance program of effort, specialist, 90 I guess, of what we funded the previous year? They take into account with their allocation. Very good. Right. Okay. Okay. So yeah. that would be adjusted. Just the month. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. 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 Thanks. And that was something else that the state said when they called us. They said if you refuse this money, it does not go back into the pool for the state of Tennessee. It would go back to and be allocated to other states. Okay. And so uh -huh. we were kind of. Requested to use the money nicely. Yes, yes, yes. I'm sure. Uh, Mr. J, are you changing the motion? Yes. Oh, yes. Thank you. That's what we're talking yeah. over, everybody. <laughs> we'll wait a minute for Mr. J. Need to check on the music. try to do something, Mary Francis. There you are, on your phone again. It's like, this coming from you okay. that's lives on her phone. It could be a real easy change. We could just say. Yeah. I know that, but she's yeah. already, I mean, do you want me to just make the motion? And no, I'm already done. done. Okay. I'm going to save it. Okay. No. You'll be able to see it. 
I make sure we got it right because it is 13 new positions. Go ahead and, and I'll I'll see if you want to modify it. Okay, you want me to make the motion? Yes, I, no, it's already. I, I, see, see, it. Yes. I see it. I see it. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Do I need to refresh? Yes, you do. Yes, you click to the other one and then click back. It'll come back to you. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Do I have a motion? I move to approve the hiring of 13 new positions and the modifications to the federal program specialist position created due to changes in federal funds. Second. Any further discussion? No. Roll call. Ms. Landers? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Ms. Fisher? Yes. Ms. Olf? Yes. Thank you. The motion has passed. Next Great time. job on this. Yeah, a lot of work. So appreciate it. And a lot of work yet to go. Yes. yes. Thank you in advance. <laughs> Next on our agenda is uh, miscellaneous FY1718 budget amendments. So I'll go through um, two and five first. Okay. Um, so two was first just a, an error. Um, when they rolled over our previous budgets to the reserve, um, there should have been carryover money for the Riverdale project. Mm -hmm. So we have to oh, leave money okay. to finish paying out the, the contractors and everything associated with that. So that's that's that amendment to that um, okay. you see there. Um, the second one is simply a reduction in Title II funding. And so there was a change in the money that we received for Title II. Or no, it was an increase. It was it the dollar? It was a decrease. 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 It was a decrease in Title II. Title II, yes. It was an increase in Title I. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I know. So anyway, so oh. we have to account for that Mr. change Jim, in uh, that title funding. The so that's the number five the document. The numbers are wrong in the motion. 215. And so this is just the, 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 the reduction of that, how that flows through that's all correct. the different line items. So we have one position funded out of Title II, and that's Shamira Davis's position. So um, with the reduction 25. of funds, we could not fully fund her Mine's position says three and, um, and, um, and all of her benefits, but the amount that we have. Right. So we had to split it. So she'll okay, have to make her okay. flight to the report. Oh. Never mind, I got it. Okay. Of her to show so federally how that's yeah, the great thing. Yeah. yeah. Oh, <laughs> Timekeeping. So, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, She'll have to be that. Okay, which is why you switch, why well, we see so many multiple lines. That's right. Okay. And okay. then we that are still sense. able to um, budget, we have to do equitable services for non public school students at a Title II as well. And so um, we completed that form, and so we have that amount in there, plus we still have money set aside Title II for professional development. So okay. it does allow us to continue to have items that we have had in the past <laughs> that we had to split her between district and federal. Okay. okay. Are there any questions on those other no. questions? No. Okay. Um, do I have a motion? I, I move to approve the miscellaneous fiscal year 1718 budget amendments two and five. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Roll call. Ms. Jones? Yes. Ms. Fisher? Yes. Ms. Yes. Ms. Landers? Yes. Thank you. Motion is passed. Next on uh, the agenda is the A2H contract for new district office. Okay. Mr. Manuel? So one of the things that we have been discussing with A2H as we're going through our um, design process with our committee, new school design, was that if we are deciding to put uh, central office space on that campus that it would be beneficial to go ahead and know size, shape, scope, so that if we're talking about running utilities, um, whether we're talking about electricity, plumbing, uh, that they have those designed. Um, Ms. Jones and I talked on the phone yesterday to answer some of her questions. But um, the reality is we're not, I'm not asking for the approval for this project. There are lots of things that I think that this board needs to discuss prior to approving this project, such as our enrollment at the middle school level, uh, whether that matches the McKibben's uh, projections. Uh, the cost of the new school, once that goes out to bid, do we have enough funds uh, from the city if that comes back at a higher cost? So there are lots of things at this time. How we're going to pay for this uh, mm -hmm. expansion, all those have to be discussed. The only thing that we're requesting at this time is to do the plan for it so that as they're looking at the whole site and they're talking about uh, all those details that we can know that. 
Um, then one of the things that they suggested too that we might consider uh, bidding this as a bid alternate to uh, the new school project that we're designing to, which means you can say, if we did it alone, how much would it cost by itself? If we did them together, how much it, it would cost? If there was stage over several years, how much would that cost? Should, if we just did the site work for this building, the plumbing utilities, how much that costs. So I think it'll be beneficial for this board to have all those price options points have, and options yeah, in mind absolutely. for this. Um, this would be paid out of Mr. Cathy's um, budget that we currently have allocated, so we're not asking for a budget amendment to this. This is just uh, because of the cost of it would be something that the board would have to approve. Mm -hmm. There is one typo in the document uh, that we found. Uh, it should be a total of 6%. Okay, uh, and so there's one typo where it says uh, 1.25 and 4.75, mm -hmm. but in the one where it says 1.25, it spells out one, one seven, and 75. 175. Mm -hmm. The correct number is 1.25%, so the total is 6%, uh, which is our standard uh, with eighth weight. Well, and the, one, and the one thing that we also discussed was the fact that no matter what, we do believe that at some point we're going to need a central office. Agreed. And to have a plan is not a bad thing, and it's and something to get, it, if you, even if you put on the shelf to dust it off, That's it's right. not something that will go unused, um, even if it's determined that it's not something that we would necessarily need in the next year. That's right, and we even talked about funding, because um, one of the things we discussed is if our lease payment is $155,000 a year, we can work a situation with the city if the, the board decided this is something we want to pay for, and just switch our lease option over to paying for this, the city goes to debt for this, just like you would do a house and instead of paying that money that's not building equity right. we're paying for it so there is no impact on the reserve so there are lots of options of how we could pay for sure. it when we could do it right things that we need to discuss i think it's important we have the, that information before we move ahead with any further Agreed. discussions on anything completely agree uh -huh. any questions for mr manuel um, do i have a motion I move to approve the A2H contract amendment to include additional services for the construction of the new district office. Second. Any further discussion? Yeah. Roll call. Ms. Holt? Yes. Ms. Landers? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Ms. Fisher? Yes. Thank you. Motion has passed. Next on our agenda is revision of um, policy SS 3.6001 fringe benefits. This is the second reading. There is no new information associated with this that I'm aware of. Um, this is just if we can go ahead and have the second reading that allows us to move forward with um, the process with our, our staff and hiring. Uh, does anyone have any questions or follow up from our previous OPEB discussions? Just curious if you've heard any more feedback on the changes or if no. it's okay. yep. Okay. Do I have a motion? I move to approve the revision of policy SS 3.6001 fringe benefits after second reading. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Roll call. Ms. Landers? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Ms. Fisher? Yes. Ms. Solf? Yes. Thank you. Motion is passed. Um, next on our agenda is HR update on hard to fill positions. Mr. Haddow? This um, update was kind of. I think talk. everybody has a sheet. I yeah. hope so, yeah. Yes. Um, just to give you a history of it, it came from my conversation with Sarah Huffman and also with Elsa. And there's some, and you kind of look at trends in, in hard to fill and how you define hard to fill and what does it look like. So that there's an outline of, of one, how, how you define it, but historically, what we've seen over the course of maybe two or three years is some of these specialist jobs, and when I say that, occupational therapist and speech therapist, they seem to be tricky rickies. Um, and if you look at the turnover rate of the speech therapist lately or over the course of three years, um, they're coming and going. And one of the reasons why is because of the market of the hospital pays more, kind of. The, ho the hospital market is a year job, 260 days or 365 days, depending on how you define a year. Our length of job is typically um, 200 days, or maybe 180, but 200 days at the end of the vacation and the, and the spring break and the fall break or what have you. So what you should try to look at is, well, why are people leaving? And why is this so hard? And why is this so difficult? And then looking at Sarah, 
you then look at, well, how many people applied into the pool of speech therapist, for instance, mm -hmm. and you see a pool of maybe seven people. Out of those seven people, maybe four are qualified, or out of those seven, three have let their license expire. Um, so you're starting to say, hey, this is, this is difficult, and you can see the duress and the stress on Sarah, and I used to see it on Teresa Price, that, hey, you know, what's going on with this? So I, this is really a, just a preliminary discussion. I think year 17 and 18, we are good. We just hired, I think, a speech therapist um, because they wanted to come over because of um, family concerns, family preference, and be home with the children over the summer, <coughs> the deal. However, the pattern continues, is that this is not going to go away. So I'm just giving you a preliminary touch, is that I'm gonna continue to look at that speech therapist type of position. The occupational therapist, there was a switch and if you and some of you guys are new and some of you aren't so new, um, before we contracted out, but based on case management of kids, we were able to hire full time. So kind of a new salary matrix had to be designed based on that hourly rate of a contracted out position, and we kept it the same. But in talking to my colleagues in other districts, actually Bartlett, um, they were saying that that salary matrix is, is really unique as well. That salary step is a zero to three years of service, or zero to two years of service, or whatever they define it as, that the person automatically doesn't move up a step, but they have to get three years in or two years in before they move up a step. Um, even that's kind of a unique perspective. So I wanted to give you an update is say, if we've got these specialist jobs filled, however, what I'm worried about is based on the definition of the Office of Personnel Management and the government. If you see that on that form in front of you, you look at that criteria of, hey, this is how they define hard to fill. And I think we have to start thinking along those ways. So it's just like a preliminary touch with this particular issue that I'm going to continue to develop as this um, course of the year extends out. What I worry about, and I'm going to switch gears on you, is the hard to fill area is that special ed system. And if you look at um, that sheet, and not to, you know, the, you know, I'm just going to talk to you, is looking at our current position control opening there have been seven SPED assistants that have left the district. Um, and where are they going and why are they going? And it seems like what they say is, hey, do you realize that Carville's paying 20 cents more? Do you realize that Bart is paying 30 cents more? And you get into these discussions, and then it, it's the same at a ma macro level. It's keeping up with the Joneses or keeping up with the Alabama football program. And once you open up Pandora's box, you better get ready to do it for the, the nurses, the ed assistants, the clerical secretaries, the support, and soon it becomes a, um, a firestorm of, right. here we go. Um, but with the SPED assistants, my thought went to some of those deals, is, is a SPED assistant really a SPED assistant? And some of it really depends on who is that kid that they're serving. Um, so, so I'm gonna use a, a personal anecdote. My brother Mike is a tennis pro, but he's also a SPED assistant because his son's got special needs, so he wanted to be in school. He is chasing kids down, and he's the, um, he's the restraint man. He's gonna go in and put a kid in restraints and he's gonna be the one that gets spit on and cussed and um, to go. And that's a little bit different than the one that is sitting in a um, need of a kid who doesn't have the, those volatilities behind them. Right. So my mind jumped to, hey, where's this, you know, if, if, if a SPED assistant went to a certain training that is certifying them to go deal with the harder to care for type of student, should that have a um, fee attached to it, a cost attached to it? A bump, but you know, a, a thank you, a token of appreciation attached mm -hmm. to it would be one. Two is is that, um, and I, I don't know if I like this term, and I, I realize that this notes. Is there a hazardous pay? I don't know if I like that term in dealing with these volatile <laughs> kids that someone could see at the front lines, the direct supervisor. Hey, Dan, this person is really engaged with this type of work, and because they're so engaged, we like to give a semi-annual bonus um, one first semester, one second semester, to help um, recognize these people and, uh, and the work that they're doing. That one's probably a little bit more of an immediate discussion than the speech therapist, occupational therapist, hey, what are we doing about salaries and how we draw people in. Mm -hmm. um, the other piece would be um, you know, the, the traditional move throughout the state, and I have not done this even though I can do it, is I can ask people throughout the state and personnel, hey, what are you doing for hard to fill areas? And the traditional one is the signing bonus hey, we're going to give you an additional, especially for those sped ed positions, um, or for possibly speech language. Or we've got a position where we can't find a chemistry teacher and are desperately looking for one. 
how are we going to recruit them? That may be a future discussion for this board to talk about. Yeah, so you may be see me asking for a pool of money. Dan, we, you know, you have our blessing. Take this pool of money and do what you have to do for hard to fill. But how do you define hard to fill? I like to, I, I do like the personal management government definition that you have in front of you. Um, but the immediate one would be that SPED assistant training certificate. Um, I don't like the term hazardous, but I'm going to have to think of another term. That if I see, if you see that throughout the course of the year, you're probably talking, you know, you know my, my rough estimate would be maybe five to ten thousand um, dollars at, at the most. And that, you know, if I can find that money, don't be surprised that if I come back to you and ask you for your um, blessing to make that amendment or that transfer, or whatever we need to do to, to help those people. But at the same time, I'm, I'm balancing Pandora's box right. as well. Yeah. And that's that's the difficult piece. Well, and, and that would be the, the one question I would have is about, um, I'm a big proponent of signing bonuses, don't you wrong? but is to see, but I've never really seen it in an education environment, and is it something that, that has a correlation to retention? Um, or is it just you're in a need, and it's what you got to do to be able to put somebody in that seat to do the best thing for your students that year, and you'll deal with that later? Mm -hmm. I understand those one off, but I mean, if we're talking about more of a policy change, um, I'd really be interested to see is there an impact to retention um, right. for those types of positions if you do make those signing bonuses. And, that, and that's a great question because I think in the SPED assistant world that is a high and maybe a high turnover field. So right now if we're hitting about 14 percent. Well, what are the other what are the other systems throughout the, right. throughout the state hitting? What's your your um, and the your attrition rate with SPED assistance? Right. Is it about 14 right. percent? You get that feedback and you do that comparison. Exactly. And, and a lot of the districts we've seen, I'm sure this is in the business world too. There's a contract that goes with that signing yes. bonus that is a lengthier one that says, yes, it's yes. a payback. So yeah. if you're okay. not going to stay with right. us for a certain period of time, perfect. you have those uh, retention pieces built in. Which would be Same. separate than the employment contract That's because right. it's related just to the, to the bonus. Okay. We'd have perfect. to do that. Oh, absolutely. 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 The other piece that's creative, or not maybe not so creative, but it's, it's if you have a really good teacher that has the soft skills and they're endorsed in history, but you see that they could work with any type of kid, can you pay for their praxis to go to get that SPED endorsement? And that would be of interest as well. So what's the typical praxis test? I have no idea back in my day, which is probably 1983. I think but if we have someone in the house that we want to repurpose right. and give them that extra Right. Push to which helps us. Well, that would be also. like professional development. Right? Right. I mean, in theory, you're the building you're you're building the strength of your bench, and so mm -hmm. I, I would not see that any different than professional development. I think that would be a great. That makes a lot yeah. of sense mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. yeah, so you're going to see those. Investment. You're going to see those conversations though, in that study and the analysis, and right. maybe come back and circle back around. Well, yeah. thank you for thinking about that. That's great. Any other questions for Mr. Haddow? No. Sounds good. Thank you. No. Thank you, everybody. We are adjourned. If after our lunch, um, any of you want to go just walk through Riverdale, okay. um, we can do that. Because they're getting in the furniture of the building. It's not pretty, it's not as pretty as it's going to be. I know, but, but I'm, I'm so that's excited. Neat thing. So if y'all if y'all want to, I'm glad for us to go over there. Okay, um, Linda, before we get out of here, where do we stand on the, you know, just as a, are we saying that we're officially building a new school, or are we still on the hybrid, well, or where uh, do we? One of the things I saw is notice that we made sure in that document that you saw, it says planning, planning. a new school. So I made sure that we that word was purposeful. Okay. Um, it, it wasn't building. I wasn't planting the flag on building um, on that one document. Okay. Um, but no, I, I think that depends on what the board decides to do in August. Yeah. Like, so so what it, so what will we be doing in August? Um, I spoke to um, Mayor Palazzolo about whether we should do a joint statement. Josh? Yes, sir. And he got back with me and said he feel comfortable with making a statement at that time. That has occurred to language. I will do it. My discussion. And I understand the reasons. We don't go to the program. Oh, no, no. like I, I talked to Jason um, yesterday, I, th I think there's a definite way you can do it without so, poking okay. them. My, my, I think the best way to do it is really.